What's up guys, we are moving on with the mission of helping you fire your coach by demystifying programming. We've covered basic methods of progressing weight, basic methods of progressing volume. We've covered some of the foundational principles. Now we're gonna start to give it a scaffolding so we can start to slap those principles on and see it come together in real time and hopefully help uh, draw some connections between some of the things you've seen that you may not have understood. So all these programs are gonna make sense no matter which ones you look at as we move forward. Real quick, Big Dreams, Bad Jeans, Barbell Apparel Store, link in the description. Bromley shirts I'm super proud of and I appreciate everybody who has bought one to support the channel. Now, on to the lesson. Today what we're talking about is broad differences in types of programs because it can be daunting to see all the different ways you can go about getting bigger or stronger, and you have a wide spectrum, actually have multiple spectrums you can choose from that range from like specificity to powerlifting, to bodybuilding, to the type of movements, to the splits, to the frequencies. It's all based on goals, uh, the way you want to make use of equipment. There's so many options. So we're gonna pick that apart and it's gonna give you some insight. And I'm gonna tell you why I tend to program the way I do and prescribe programming the way I do. So we're gonna start with one of the spectrums. All the way over here, we're gonna be talking about movement. We're gonna be talking about um, barbell stuff that focuses on specific patterns because focusing on movement patterns has its own list of benefits, but its own list of pitfalls you have to worry about. On the other end, you have hypertrophy, bodybuilding stuff, focusing on muscles individually. The types of movements you choose are gonna be different. The way you execute is different. Again, benefits, but also pitfalls. And then there's kind of a cool way you can marry them to really round yourself out and um, really put off uh, plateaus or solve problems as they pop up because you have more tools in your belt. We just want to do it in a way that's not more complex than it needs to be. I'm actually going to argue I think it's less complex to pull a little bit from each from each side. So starting out with movement-based stuff, we're again focusing on movement patterns, so it's very neurologically based. That's one of the adaptations that's kind of cool is that you have more things your body can improve by virtue of getting the nervous system online. So you're a little more coordinated. You can move a little faster. Your timing can be better. So there's a lot of neat things about that that don't really apply when you're focusing on one muscle group at a time. Although there are neurological adaptations that go on there. But especially when you're new, like you're gonna see improvement just by virtue of getting comfortable with the lift. And then you'll notice you can push harder. You can go a little farther. You can get a little bit more out of it. And that's even something you realize as you get more advanced is that you can pivot into certain movements that have their own little learning curve. So even though you're strong by getting good at those, you see the numbers improve and that load in turn causes adaptations. That's kind of cool. But we break movement patterns up down. It's almost always barbell focused. Um, I mean, I guess you could argue that things like kettlebells, that there's some other movement protocols you can use that are movement focused. But barbells normally what we focus on just because it's easy, it's standardized, universal. That's why it's the backbone of like all athletic training everywhere you go. People keep trying to reinvent it, but it's like gimmicky shit. Um, hinging, squatting, pushing, pulling. Those are the, the big main movement patterns that your body breaks down into. Two movement patterns broadly for the lower body, two for the upper body. People will nitpick and they'll go to like vertical push versus horizontal push. So it's like a bench versus an overhead. Similarly for pulling or rowing, a, a pull up versus a bent row. That's we don't need to nitpick that far quite yet. Basically, those are the four ways you can move. So hinging is, of course, deadlifting. That's focusing specifically on the hips. The main hip extensors are going to be the glutes and the hamstrings. In addition to everything above the hips is going to have to work to stabilize your trunk. So good erector, abdominal, upper back stimulus from doing things like that. Squatting is, of course, you're doing that, but also bending at the knees. So now the quads come into play. And you do get a lot of the other benefits as well. Um, pushing pec, shoulders, triceps broadly, pulling upper back, biceps broadly. And that can break down into a couple of different approaches. So if we assume that we're just gonna focus on movements, we're gonna progress that, not worry about anything else. My idea is that if I get better at this movement, that means I'm going to have to gain muscle and have to get stronger as a byproduct. And that's a viable way of looking at it. Looking at it as skill. I just have to get good at the movement. I have to practice the movement, get good uh, at it. That's novice programs like simple linear progressions 
where you really just squat, bench, deadlift, overhead, repeat it over time, make very simple leaps forward with your progression. And yeah, you get developed, works very well for a period of time. And then there's advanced programs that actually do the same thing. These rearrange themselves a little bit so that really, really advanced lifters can sustain it without burning out. So you just have to do a little bit of stuff as far as like keeping the effort back a little bit, maybe throwing in a little bit of variety. Frequency might be higher, but you're not just always trying to add weight constantly. It's a little more elaborate, but it can be done. And a lot of world-class powerlifting um, students, as well as coaches have done that. Borshenko is somebody I cite routinely. His program's very, very focused on movement patterns, very specific to the sport of powerlifting, uh, but made for more advanced lifters. So beyond something simple and barbell-based, you can look at varied programs that include a little bit more variety. So these are going to, this is a lot of what I write, where it's gonna be, yeah, squatting, benching, deadlifting, but also variations of those. Sometimes for the sake of it, sometimes to bring up weak points, sometimes just so it's not monotonous so you don't go crazy. And there's a lot of benefits to doing a varied program. You're gonna be a little more well-rounded and you can pinpoint weak points as you get better. Novices don't need to do that whatsoever. It's one of the worst things a novice can do because you don't have anything that's weak because everything's weak. You have to be developed. You have to have gained some ground, seen your lifts evolve before you realize how your leverages and your anthropometry and your muscular development has worked against you or the things that don't grow quite as much in relationship to everything else. That happens for everybody. Benching's a great example. You need a lot of your upper body to be big and strong to be a good bencher. Benching doesn't do all of that. So how your triceps or shoulders or upper back is gonna evolve, it's different for everybody. So people as they go along are going to need different protocols to keep that train going. And then lastly, we have highly targeted stuff that does actively focus on weak points. And that's kind of what I was talking about with Shaco, where you have advanced methods for strength athletes or powerlifters, where you're not just squatting, benching, deadlift, deadlifting, but you have a razor sharp focus on where am I deficient? And this again, this is very advanced. You don't need to do this until you've been doing one particular thing for a very long time, because then you can say, oh, every time I peak my deadlift, I get stuck right below the knee. Every time I get close to a max attempt, I can light it up as I get stronger, 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 but I'm leaving like 30 pounds because of that one little weak point right there. And you can start to incorporate exercise for that. Now, moving on to the other side, we have, this is again, the complete other side of the spectrum. There's a lot of real estate in between that we'll cover, but this is just purely focusing on muscle. This is essentially bodybuilding. You don't care about movement patterns in the slightest. You're trying to get a very well-rounded physique and you're focused on isolation. So you split everything into body parts. Not a lot to talk about there. The, the big thing is the recommendations are gonna be different based on recovery ability. And we're gonna talk about that. I have another board for you guys. Um, but before we get to that notice, that movement patterns kind of pretty nicely contain the muscle groups. Hinging, we just talked about. You hinge at the hips, so your glutes and hamstrings are the movers. Everything above the waist in your torso just about gets taxed, although it doesn't have to move. It still gets taxed pretty heavily. So hinging movements, you're gonna find that on like glute and hamstring days. That's what you're going to find, the same type of movements. Bodybuilders will absolutely throw in things like good mornings or Romanian deadlifts, in addition to all the smaller isolation stuff. Similarly with pushing, you're gonna have your chest, shoulders, and triceps. So you're gonna find there's a lot of overlap and not everybody does their isolation split that way, but there is a lot of room to kind of consolidate. And that's essentially where you get into power building where it's like, okay, I don't just have bench day, but I don't just have chest and tricep day. I have a blend where I'm focusing on strength, but also um, doing stuff to, to pick up the weak points to make sure I'm well-rounded. And in the middle of that, you can theoretically kind of optimize size and being well-rounded and being efficient with also optimizing strength and the neurological adaptations that come with the movement pattern. For many years, that was just called training. You look back to a lot of 60s, 70s strength guys, it's a lot of what they did, but specificity as a sport evolved really ran away. So you get these conflicting schools of training, but the thing is, there's still a lot of examples of guys doing all of them. So I maintain it has more to do with you picking a program that's effective or a method, an approach that's effective and just getting good at that instead of having to rediscover the learning curve every single time you hop around. I think that's what's best for everybody. But the idea is that these methods come together in kind of a synthesized program. And that's appropriate, I think, for a lot of you guys that are focused in strength, but also general development. So examples of these two different types, I mean, if we have your prototypical muscle-oriented, isolation-oriented bodybuilding physique guy who doesn't care so much about his main lifts, I this is controversial. I'm going to start off with this. I would argue that there's going to be less growth early on just because there's a lot more variety. Now, that's great for a couple of reasons. Variety allows 
play. It allows you to discover new movements, to build wide kinesthetic ability, which is absolutely fantastic. But getting all those things, doing them in kind of a cohesive workout fashion, and then progressing them, it takes a little bit longer to get that down. And these guys, when you start out, you know, you're a novice, you're too weak to work. You're too weak to get a lot out of every single individual thing. And it takes time to build that up. So you, you tend to see with movement guys that start on like pure linear progressions where I'm just squatting, benching, deadlifting, and progressing that forward. You tend to see faster growth early on because coordination is now a thing. And that's the superpower. The movement pattern allows another dimension of improvement that you can capitalize on early on. Now, I'm not saying that's substantial. That's why you should go with this over that because you have to think long-term. How does this stuff set you up long-term? And I don't think one is obviously better than the other. They're both, uh, they're both advantaged. I mean, this mimics uh, what youth athletes do. You want more variety, so you're more well-rounded down the road when you start specializing, where this might give you a little more of a, a brick wall that's like right in front of you where you plateau earlier and it's like, holy shit, what do I do? So you'll have less tools in your box technically. So again, trade-offs. And of course, these are extremes. A lot of people will find themselves bodybuilding at the start or doing something like starting strength at the start, but there is room to kind of pull elements of all, all of them. And I'll talk about that later. So being well-rounded, extremely important. Again, squatting, benching, deadlifting doesn't specifically make your triceps, your rear delts, your lats, um, your midsection as strong as it could possibly be. If you were doing more targeted movements, uh, the play aspect I think is great for people psychologically. This is important for people that like to go in and experiment and play. That was huge for me. I love spending time in the gym. I love doing everything under the sun. Not everybody is like that. That's going to be an important factor for your path. More time at the gym, yes, even if you're running something like high intensity, more exercises to piecemeal your body out, that just means more time. Um, more uh, recovery ability though, that's a, a positive. The isolation movements don't tend to take it out of you. You don't need to typically deload unless you're really, really in a vicious cycle where you're pushing the tempo after you're already pretty well developed. But like newbies don't really have to worry about that. Most intermediate bodybuilders don't really have to worry about that unless you're getting real heavy on heavier lifts. The movement oriented guys, again, faster growth. Gains are gonna be more centralized though. The big takeaway between these physiques, don't look at this and be like, oh, the muscle guys get more jacked and lean and the movement guys get more stocky or whatever. Generally, I'm assuming that physique guys care about their body fat a little bit more. That has nothing to do with your training. It's almost all diet. So you're gonna assume that a movement guy is more focused on strength, so they're probably eating more calories. That's a very, very broad generalization. Of course, you could do this and be jacked and eat chicken, rice, and broccoli all day and do your cardio. Um, but generally, you're gonna see uh, more focus on smaller muscles. I mean, even before these guys get really big, you'll see traps and delts, triceps poking out. You'll see their calves and forearms develop because attention is being paid to that. But these guys, I know for me, my back, my shoulders, and my ass exploded. Everything else, uh, my quads a little bit. The, my vastus lateralis, not my quads entirely. But I had very centralized growth around the biggest joints, around my shoulders, around my hips, everything grew. The extremities stayed small. I looked like a potato that somebody stuck some toothpicks in for limbs. It wasn't a good look. So for aesthetics or for rounding out weaknesses, that's a potential problem. Now it takes less time, it's more simple for starting somebody out. I always say I can write this on a cocktail napkin here. This is how you're training. Less time, that's also a plus but less recoverability. Again, novices don't really have to worry about that, but as you get advanced, movement-based, barbell-based stuff, recovery is the trick. Bodybuilders, when you're working at eight, 10, 12 reps, um, there's a lot of play in the joints. You can recover even while you're pushing it. Are you looking for access to exclusive programs from the best minds in the field and some of your favorite YouTube influencers? Then look no further than Boost Camp. Boost Camp is a long-term sponsor of this channel, and I wouldn't be partnered with them if they didn't provide a premier product. If you want optimal performance, you can't just wing your weight selection. You have to make deliberate steps forward. So you need a program and you need a way to track progress on it. Boost Camp makes it easy to track your workouts from the convenience of your phone. So you never have to rely on your sloppy handwriting or your bad memory. And they give you access to a library of exclusive programs from some of the most well-known names in the business. Eric Helms, Bryce Lewis, Jeffrey Verity Schofield, Bald Omni-Man, and yours truly. We all have programs up there that can only be found on the app and it is absolutely free. My programs, Bull Mastiff and 70s Powerlifter are both up there. And you can also check out Full Sturker, which I wrote to tell you how to get strongman jacked using just the things you find in a regular corporate gym. So a special thank you to Boost Camp for making this channel possible. Unburden yourself from the hard business of making the perfect program from scratch. We've got them pre-made for you. Download their app right now by clicking on the link in the description. So getting into the recovery aspect, because that is the most important thing. It's not really about where you start, wherever you start. 
It's just on you to run the learning curve, figure it out, milk everything you can, be as good at it as you can, because there's a lot of room to improve regardless of what type of training you do, as long as you commit and as long as you get good. That's very important to know. But whatever you do pick, you need to know how to recover. The big thing about recovery is that there tends to be a, a specific amount of work, a specific type of work, where even if you come back a week later, even if you're not sore, even if your fuel stores are replenished, you're still not quite as good as you were before. That's strength training. Powerlifters, strength athletes have to worry about that. Bodybuilders, not so much. And especially a bodybuilder, you don't really have to be 100% recovered to get through your next workout because you're not so fixated on the weight. Chasing weight is not the most important thing. You're not on a deadline. You're not on a timeline. You don't have to predict exactly how strong you're going to be. So with barbell stuff, you're looking at big movement patterns, so things where a lot of weight is moved over a wide range of motion using a lot of joints and muscles with maximal strain getting to the point where weight is involuntarily slowing down. Not that you're moving it slow, but you're pushing, 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 and the weight's moving slower, slower, slower. Great for a developmental growth. That's where you get a lot of cross bridging, a lot of mechanical tension, a lot of people obsess over, but it is a good growth stimulus. And if there's a high percentage specifically, because you can do something like a, a stiff leg deadlift, wide range of motion, big muscles, you can strain, but if you're straining on rep number 20, you might get sore, that's a good growth stimulus, but we generally don't associate that with, holy shit, you're gonna have to take two weeks before you can do that movement again and be as strong. So this colloquially gets referred to as CNS fatigue. And I've done videos on CNS fatigue, I hate talking about it because people can't keep straight what it is we're talking about. We're talking about the phenomenon, think of a power lifter, especially the more advanced you are, the worse it gets. Julius Maddox, you might think Julius Maddox could bench 750 for like a PR in that year, wherever his training is. And it's the most weight he's hit that year. And he can come in seven days later and hit 760. Or that he can even do 750 again. He can't. And anybody who's coached at a high level knows that. That you get a guy who squats a thousand pounds. You can't hit a thousand pound squat, come in a week later and reproduce that effort. So the stronger you get, and this is applies for a lot of uh, intermediates as well. It applies for me on a shit ton of movements. I know that if I'm really strong one day, like on a deadlift especially, oh my God, if I come in seven days later, I can't reproduce that. So that colloquially is CNS fatigue. That's, that's the type of fatigue we have to worry about where we're not really, it's not muscular, it's not fuel stores, it's not our sleep, it's not our food, it's not our psychology. It must be something neurological and we don't quite know what the mechanism is, but you don't need to need that, know that. You just need to be able to identify it and work around it. So given these, generally looking 85 to 90%, RP 9 to 10 uh, multiple weeks in a row. That's a big thing. It's not that you do it once and you're screwed. As you accumulate those workouts, it gets harder and harder and harder. So there's a lot of people that have gotten used to when they were younger or more novice doing a lot of frequent workouts, just going harder, harder, harder every time. And then you wonder why that stops working. Well, eventually doing it less frequently. So going, let's say weekly, and then eventually like alternating weeks or waving weeks back and forth. That's a big thing to keep it going. And it always takes a ton of time to discover that because it's not explicitly stated. So all this that's a bad time. It's fun when it works. And for some people it works great and they can do it for a while. But for most people you fall apart quick and it looks like this, you go heavy, then holy shit, the next week, oh my God, I'm stronger. Then, oh my God, I'm really strong. Best workout of my life. And then these are little like, I don't know what these are, little red recovery demons hovering above you. So you drop, you're like, what the shit? I was really strong last week, what happened? And then you try to come back again and you're like, oh my God, now, like, now I feel like I can't get out of bed. I can't lift anything. Maybe you take a prolonged period of recovery or sometimes what happens, you put your head down and go through it. Sometimes your body eventually adapts and people reinforce in their head, I just got to be stronger and more grit and I just got to push through that brick wall. And again, when you're young, you're full of piss and vinegar, sometimes you can bridge that gap through sheer stubbornness. Most of the time you can't. And as you get stronger, that's untenable. It also opens up the possibility of recovery and overuse issues, which will fuck all of your training. So whether you can push through or whether you just continue spiraling, it doesn't really matter so much. You need to get in the habit of identifying when this pops up and take uh, take appropriate steps. So what we do, it's, it's the same few things. You can deload. So deloads are so common. So much so that people are deloading when they haven't even earned a deload. You do want to earn a deload. A deload's after you stack multiple weeks uh, of really, really hard work but it's a preventative. So you, you increase a little bit over a three or four week period, then boom, deload. Then you pick up where you left off, increase a little bit, boom, deload. And then you pick up where you left off. So you find that deload allows you to come and recover and you bypass this whole like CNS is toast 
type of bullshit. Or you can reset. We've gone over wave progressions. It's over several weeks, you kind of aggressively build up in anticipation that you're gonna drop back and run back up. So there's kind of a deload built into that, but even if it's not specifically a deload, it's still kind of an ebb and flow of effort on a predictable cycle. And then lastly, you change something. The movement pattern is a big one. Again, if we're assuming it's neurological, doing the same movement every single week, benching to a max every single time you come in, same structures getting hit with maximal effort at the same time. So a switch in the movement is a form of recovery neurologically and the structures are getting hit a little bit different. That can be the thing. That's what West Side uses. That's the only reason they can max every single week. They wouldn't be able to do that if it was the same movement every time because neurologically you'd just be hammering the same structures. They would not be allowed to recover. So movement selection is a big one, but that's complex. I don't like that workout to workout after several blocks of training, I like that. Not workout to workout. You need to do things long enough to get good at them. Uh, you can change the rep range. Periodization, it's like I'm in tens, I'm increasing. You know what, I wanna keep increasing. Let's drop down to eights or sixes and I can accommodate, continue to increasing weight while I go. Or you can arbitrarily move back and forth. If you're hammering fives and you're up against a wall, you can take a block to do eights, tens, twelves or something like that. So you can change the rep range as a form of um, getting around that, that's something new, something novel, uh, or you can change volume. You know, if you've been hammering volume over and over and over, a lot of work, then taking time to recover, dropping that volume down. Again, periodization, that's what powerlifters do anyways as they get more specific. You can do it if you're not a powerlifter, just as a means of switching it up. So if you've been pushing it for three, four, five months, it's like, well, what if I drop the volume back? Or on the other hand, if you've been doing hit for a while, well, what happens if I start to, to have volume kick back up a little bit? There's a lot of things you can change. So a couple examples, some of my favorite progressions, and one of the next videos is gonna be about collecting these progressions because they all have specific use cases for how advanced you are, what your goals are, what your tolerance to work is, and you wanna get good at identifying them and picking them apart so you can be like, hmm, that might fit my recovery ability, my tolerance for like deadlifts. If I have a sucky deadlift recovery ability, I might need something a little more special for that than benching, which I find I can get away with pretty recklessly. So that's what you wanna keep track of. But these are some examples. 1020 Life, Brian Carroll, it's a really good powerlifting book. Simple, simple progression. He's a little unique because he only does two workouts before a deload. And he'll progress the whole thing pretty linearly. It'll go three workouts to top fives, I believe, uh, three workouts, top fives into top threes, and he'll just descend reps in a linear fashion, but he's just interrupting it with deloads every two weeks so he can clear out, come out strong for the next one, and effort just climbs as the weight drops so he gets closer and closer and closer to a peak. This is also appropriate for guys if you just wanna go ham. Some guys will just max every week. You could do that for a couple of weeks, then deload. Do that again for a couple of weeks, deload. It's a little more strenuous, probably a little less predictable, but if you are just wanting to go hard, more frequent deloads will guarantee that you can do that longer and it's sustainable. Lily Bridge example is another good one. Um, and again, these are all just ways of, of uh, handling the problem of balancing stress or recovery. Enough stress and the right type of stress to grow, but enough recovery that I can actually get stronger and improve week to week. So uh, Lily Bridge would do a uh, heavy squat, followed by a light deadlift, like speed deadlift right after. Then next week, he'd switch it. Heavy deadlift followed by speed squat. He gets specific technical touches that he needed as one of the best lifters in the world, uh, but also he gets enough recovery. So he can go as hard as he can, and he knows it's gonna be two weeks before he comes in and does that again. Very sustainable, especially for more advanced guys. I'm, I know a lot of really good deadlifters, especially in strongman, that would only deadlift heavy twice a week for that reason. So they could do all the other strongman work that taxes your posterior chain. Again, trying to solve a problem. How much heavy ass work can I get away with or can I not really get away with it and I need to do other work and build up to the heavy stuff at the very end. 531 is another good example of a wave. You do an AMRAP of five or more reps. Next week, three or more reps, so it's heavier. Next week, one or more reps, so it's even heavier. And then you either deload or you back off. So that's an example of a reset. And that wave allows you to continue progressing because the heaviest workouts are four weeks apart. Very sustainable. Periodization, good old fashioned, classical Western periodization. It's very simple. It's starting like a lot of sets of something light with high reps, tens, and then you add weight where you can. And again, you're accommodating. You're accommodating by changing the rep range. Weight's gonna go up, effort's gonna go up. I'm just gonna drop the rep ranges so it's sustainable. And I'm gonna do that all the way till the ultimate conclusion. And you'll see all this blended. There's 
classical periodization splits that have deloads thrown in um, because even if you're not going 100% on all the workouts, fatigue still accumulates. Uh, there's a lot of mixing and matching, but these are some basic strategies. So at least you know what's going on when you take a look at them so you can see, holy shit, uh, yeah, I know exactly why that super complex Shaco program is oriented that way. It's because it's moving back and forth trying to handle the lifter's need for recovery. So that's it. So the basic idea is that if you are going to incorporate heavy ass barbell stuff, even with the synthesis of more easily recoverable stuff like isolation work, bodybuilding work, machines, whatever, you need to be aware of this. And it's not as complex as it looks. As you get comfortable pushing the envelope, you're gonna have a sense of how long it takes you to really be fresh. And that'll give you insight of what type of strategy you wanna follow. But one of the easiest ways to do it is to take a strength progression, anything like this, one appropriate for you and where you're at, and have that be the main thing you do for the main lift. And then you can populate the rest of the workout with variations. We're gonna go over exercise variations next. So we'll talk about uh, exercise selections, what they do, why you would pick one or the other. And then even further down, it's like we got the big rocks and we're getting the small rocks and you can go into, okay, well, bicep and tricep work, targeted work for weak points, you know, hamstring curls and GHDs and good mornings and lunges and everything else. And eventually you have a very well-rounded program that's guaranteed to develop a very hypertrophic body but also have you very strong, have all those movement patterns taken care of. These are just the types of things you wanna keep in mind when you're trying to evaluate. So that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Questions and comments below. Till next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.